Amen. Okay, y'all. Bibles, electronic devices, John chapter 1, 35 through 51. Uh, every spring at the University of Massachusetts, or what that's the school I went to, or what we would call UMass, when the world would finally thaw and people would come out to the light again, um, a mysterious man would always come to campus every spring for a couple of days. Who, he, who was he? Well, no one really knew. That's why he was called the mysterious man. But why did he come? Everyone knew from the... <laughs> From the president to the professors to the students to the food service personnel, everyone knew why he came. Why did he come? Well, he came because he came carrying this big old 10-foot wooden cross. And he would lug it all over campus. But he did have two wheels on the bottom of this big old wooden cross so he could get uphill and maneuver around because there's so many hills at UMass. Uh, UMass is a campus of about 28,000 students. It sits in a massive valley called Pioneer Valley. Uh, it's southwest campus alone. So if you were in southwest, is where I live. That campus alone had six 26-story dorms. Can you imagine that at Baylor? Can you imagine that? And then woven throughout them uh, were six low-rise dorms that were all throughout this. Uh, UMass used to be the most popular place in the United States per square foot until Michigan built some monstrosity of a dorm system. Uh, what would happen is that if you lived in that area, you'd be woken up at least once a night, usually around 3 a.m. You know why? Because someone would go in and pull a fire alarm on one of those 26-story dorms. Do you know what those people had to do? They had to walk down the stairs and evacuate the building, clear it out, and then everybody had to walk back in. Imagine the folks that lived on the 26th floor. And this would happen at least once a night. Now, this is where UMass is affectionately known in that area as ZooMass, and I think it started there. And the reason why is that when the evacuees were up at 3 in the morning, they thought the whole campus should be up, too, with them. So it got a little crazy, right? Well, each spring, this mystery man would arrive, and when he did, word would spread incredibly quickly. <laughs> especially among the freshmen, because this is their first time to see him. Some dude lugging a 10-foot cross all over campus, right? <clears throat> so huge crowds would gather to see this strange thing. And then he would open his mouth. And then he would say things that I can't repeat here this morning. He would say vulgar things about you. He would pick you out in a crowd and start calling you out and naming these unpardonable sins that he somehow supernaturally knew that you were committing. And nine out of ten of them were some sexual sin. And then he would command you to be more righteous and good like he was, right? Now, whenever he came to town, the whole campus knew what Christianity was about. <laughs> the whole campus knew that Christianity was about avoiding sin, and that Christians were mean people who avoided sin, unlike the rest of the world. Now, I think it's safe to say, don't do that. Right? Uh, that, that's not how you reach people, right? That's not how to reach people. The passage that we're going to look at this morning is the birth of the church. It's the beginning of people being reached. The first people on the planet to be reached by Jesus are happening in this passage. Can you imagine? This is the first week of Jesus' historical, official ministry where he, he launches his reaching, renewing work into the world. This is the first week, and most scholars like to point out the comparison that John paints between creation week, the first seven days, the first week of creation, life being made, and and how the, the first week of Jesus is mapped out in six, seven days in a week. It's like John is saying, behold, he's making all things new. He's making a new world, a new creation, right? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to look at how to reach people this morning by looking at how not to reach people this morning. How do you reach people by looking at how you don't? Please stand for the hearing of God's word.
John 1, 35 through 51. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, So you are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered, Rabbi. You are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is the word of the Lord. Be Please be seated, y'all. So, Lord, I ask that you would shine on the page. We ask that you would fill us with your spirit, give clarity to our minds, realness to our heart, Lord. Uh, would, you, would you cause us to experience this text? And we ask this in your name. Amen. All right, there's a pastor, and he wrote this. He said, in the first five years of my ministry, I had a sign on my desk that said, win the world for Christ. In the next five years of his ministry, he said he had a sign, a new sign that read, win one or two people for Christ. And now, he says, towards the end of his ministry, he has this sign of his desk, try not to lose too many for Christ, right? Uh, how not to reach people. How do you not reach people? The first answer from this text is, if you don't want to reach people, avoid preaching, Look at verse 35. The next day, again, John was standing. Standing is implying a regular behavior, an official reality that he's engaged in. He has a ministry that's been going on for a while that's transitioning to Jesus, but he's in the habit of standing and doing some, something. He was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. So the again standing is referring to John regularly preaching and teaching. That's what he's doing. He's regularly, every day, preaching and teaching. And what the Apostle John is highlighting right now, right here at this part of the text, this part of the historical record, this part of the birth of the church, how does the church begin? By preaching. Notice what kind of preaching is taking place. Look at verse 36. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God. This is 
Lamb of God preaching. This is Jesus preaching. I want you to look at verse 29. This is when John the Baptist preaches for the first time that's recorded here. This is the day before this day. Then look at verse 36, 29, 36. Do you see what's happening here? It's the same sermon. It's the same sermon. So just on a side, I, should feel, I feel a little better about that, don't you? You know, every once in a while, maybe I could pull one out. Would that be okay? Preach the same sermon? It's the same sermon because everything about this historical record is intentional. The Apostle John and John the Baptizer is intentionally teaching us something about preaching, biblical preaching. And the first thing that they want to show us is that biblical preaching is how the church began. In other words, biblical preaching reaches people. Don't miss this. Look at verse 37. Watch the power of his preaching. Watch the effectiveness of his preaching. Something happens while he's preaching. The two disciples heard him say, and they followed Jesus. Heard him means they got it, y'all. What it means is the picture is here is while John is preaching, behold the Lamb of God, they heard him. They heard him in their hearts. They heard him in the bottom and the roots of their existence. Jesus became clear to their minds and real to their hearts. They heard him in such a way that they had faith in him. Do you see what faith is here? Faith is an effect. It's not a cause. In other words, preaching first, Jesus first, and all of a sudden the effect of that, the power of that is we trust him. There's faith in him. Faith happened. Following happened. So they were reached and they were renewed. All by preaching. If Paul was here, he'd say, listen, y'all, faith, clarity to your mind, realness to your heart, being gripped by Jesus in such a way that you, you trust him and you follow him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the words about Jesus Power in words about Jesus. Biblical preaching, secondly, notice it has one controlling, centering, dominating subject. Preaching may have like individual complements of a sentence. It may have infinitives and participles modifying a sentence. But preaching ultimately, no matter where you are in the Bible, has one dominating, ultimate, controlling subject. And it's Jesus. But you all see, it's not just any kind of word or message about Jesus. It's not like, be like Jesus. I'm sorry if I'm going to offend you. If you have the wristband, what would Jesus do? I'd say, cut it off. It's not about Jesus as a moral example. It's not Jesus as your life coach. It's not Jesus as a spiritual advisor. It's not even Jesus as this phenomenal teacher, what he was. It's Jesus in a specific word. Jesus in a specific subject. Jesus as the Lamb of God. Jesus as Savior. You know what that means? That means that the one dominating, controlling subject of every part of the Bible, every part of the Bible is delivering us a specific sliver of splendor, a specific aspect of Jesus and his salvation. It's like taking one diamond that's breathtakingly beautiful and bountiful and incredibly expensive and giving you this cut and it takes your breath away. Then it moves it in another passage and gives you this cut of the diamond. But it's always one diamond. And it's always what Jesus is doing, has done, and will do for us. It's always Jesus' accomplishments, Jesus' activity, Jesus' work, Jesus' doing, Jesus' living, Jesus' dying, Jesus' resurrection, Jesus on the move. And that reaches us and renews us 
It's the great power that brings us into the Christian life. And it's the only power that grows you in the Christian life. In other words, both Johns, the baptizer and the apostle, are saying preaching is good news, not good advice. Dennis Baker said, look, even a church service can get pretty interesting when Jesus shows up. John would say, even preaching can get really interesting when Jesus shows up. So maybe if we put away some of the how to fix your marriage and put in Jesus in the text, you actually might fix your marriage. Biblical preaching is also the preacher. Do you see this? Looking intently at Jesus while he's preaching. Look at 35 and 36. John was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked intently at Jesus as he walked by and said, or he preached, Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, looking, looking, the preacher looking at Jesus intently is how a preacher is supposed to preach while he delivers Jesus. This is the secret of what's called spirit-anointed preaching. It's not as mysterious as we make it. Most times you hear that, oh, he's, he's anointed with the Spirit. I, I, I just instinctively like reflex. What is he? Does he got boogie dust? What, what does he have? What is Spirit-anointed preaching? You know what the great preachers of old and the great church historians of old says? The great ones that had what's called the sacred anointing or Spirit anointing is preachers that look intently at Jesus while they preach, to be spirit-anointed, to be spirit-empowered, to be filled with the Spirit in the act of preaching is to actually look intently at Jesus, not just in the text, but for the preacher himself. And so the power of preaching is both Jesus preaching, the one ultimate controlling, dominating subject, and it's Jesus anointed preaching. It's preachers intently looking at Jesus while they preach. All right, so um, I was encouraged to do this, so I'm going to do this. It's kind of weird for me to do, but it's not about me, even though when I read this, you're going to think it's about me, but it's just the dilemma of communication. Uh, every once in a while, I get letters and Sometimes you get a letter. I mean, you get a letter. This is one of those letters. Uh, Dear Jeff, I meant to send this letter and birth announcement this past summer, but life got busy and I'm not much for writing, so it turned into a Christmas card. You probably don't remember me, but we met in the summer of 2009 at an RUF summer conference in Florida. I spoke uh, to the RUF summer conference to hundreds of college kids that summer. My brother Rob and I were there, and we were struck by your preaching. I began to listen to your sermons. Later that summer, I began my journey in the Marine Corps, and I continued to listen as it took me over, took me all over the world. That journey has been a long, slow, spiritual train wreck in which the seeds of the gospel produced an inevitable conflict with a driven person in a performance-oriented organization. I grew up in a household that valued the Bible but also valued achievement, as did our particular brand of performance Christianity. I used to read the scriptures to find examples to emulate, motivation to do better. By God's grace, I ended up at RUF during college and started to hear about a righteousness received, not a righteousness achieved. But I had a long way to go before I could make life choices that were gospel-based and gospel-oriented. And I continued to choose performance every time. So the Marine Corps was a natural choice for a driven person like me. And I poured myself into the work, often making casualties of my wife or young children. But through some difficult times and dark days, I continued to listen to your preaching. It made the good news come alive. It reached me and brought me back to the word in a way that nothing else did. By looking for the gospel in every passage, you help to change the way I read scripture. And then he talks about the series on Galatians. I continued to listen as I left the Marine Corps and through the resulting struggles with depression and inadequacy while I looked for a civilian career. Catherine also listened as she struggled through my deployments, holidays alone, and a miscarriage. Rob, my brother, listened for years as he has repeatedly suffered through hard decisions to say no to being impressive. 
My whole family now listens to your preaching, including my sister Virginia, who's a psychiatrist. She loved your recent series on depression and shared it with several of her patients. When Catherine and I were deciding on a baby name this past spring, we liked the idea of naming him after a preacher. Our third child, Ellis, is now my great-great-uncle, who's an ordained preacher. We went around and around until my wife said, let's name him Hatton. Can you believe that? So, this is David Hatton. So I now tell my kids, hey, I can disown you. <laughs> I have a namesake now. Preachy, I don't even know him. And Joe, if you are listening, because I think you are, would you please send your address? I lost your envelope, so I cannot respond to your letter. So there you got that, too. If you want to not reach people, avoid preaching. Also, second, avoid making friends. Look at verse 40. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Verse 41. He first found his own brother, Simon. Verse 42. He brought him to Jesus. This is phenomenal, y'all. Andrew. Andrew, you get four times you get to meet this dude. Four times in the gospel, Andrew shows up. Do you know what he's doing every single time he's mentioned in the gospels? Bringing someone to Jesus. Here he goes to his brother, his own brother is the first one he takes to Jesus. I want you to look at that line. He first found his own brother. I want you to feel the power of that statement because it speaks to the quality of their relationship. In other words, you can have a brother and not be friends. We can have neighbors and not make friends. You can be on, a, on a, a ball club. Your kid can be on a ball club, and you've got all those parents and all those kids and all those parents, and you can be there together and not make friends. You can be involved in school activities as a parent because your kid's in school activities and not make friends. You can have your own children and not make friends. You can have employees and not make friends. You can have fellow classmates. You can go to the same school. You can be in the same classes. You can be on the same ball team. You can be in the same music hall and not make friends. If you don't want to reach people, avoid making friends. Notice how reaching people by making friends, though, is so normal in this passage. It's so natural. It's so ordinary. It's so unspectacular. It's so real. It's so earthy. It's so human. Do you see this? It's simple invitations to friends. Jesus simply says to his two new friends, Andrew and some unnamed dude that most folks think is John the Apostle writing this gospel. Notice what he says to him. Hey, man, come and see. Verse 39, come and see. Jesus wasn't carrying a big old 10-foot wooden cross. Hey, man, come and see. Look at Philip when he says to his friend, and notice they're in the same hometown as Andrew and Simon, Nathaniel. What does he say to him? Verse 46, come and see, Nathaniel. Come on, you check it out. I can't answer all your questions because you're like, you got tons of questions. Come and see. Come and see. And then you can hear Andrew because he's bringing Peter. He's bringing his brother. He's bringing Simon at the time to Jesus. They're told. We're told he's bringing him. We're not told the conversation, but you can darn well assume while he's bringing Peter, he's saying to him, hey, man, come check him out yourself. He's the better David, bro. Really? Yeah, man, come on. Come check it out. Come and see. I mean, John is showing us that people are reached by simple invitations to church, simple invitations to coffee, simple invitations to have an adult beverage in a nice place or an unnice place. Actually, the unnice places I prefer. 
Simple invitations to a woman's Bible study. Simple invitations to Sunday school. Simple invitations to watch a UFC fight. Simple invitations to dinner or lunch. Simple invitations to, hey, listen to the podcast. Simple invitations to, hey, have you heard this article before? Simple invitations. Hey, you want to go to this play in midweek? We do this stuff where we got kids, and it's got stuff for the kids and stuff for the youth and, and stuff for grown people, too, on Wednesday nights at our church. We eat together, and then we break up, and everybody goes to their, their particular place. Come and see, man. Simple, simple, simple invitation. People are reached by simple invitation. Come and see. If you don't want to reach people, avoid making friends. Third, avoid gospel conversations. Look at verse 38. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, what are you seeking? I mean, Jesus is answering. He's asking this most fundamental question to Andrew and his unnamed friend. Now, notice what Jesus is saying. Jesus is basically asking the most fundamental question of life. It's a question that awakens the human condition. It's a question that reaches down into the depths and the the dark places of the human heart where we don't even know where they are. It's a question that hits home and hits the heart. It's a question like, hey, Andrew, what are you for in life? John, what do you, what do you want in life? If Luther was here, he'd say, oh, my word. Basically what Jesus is saying or asking, what's your salvation, Andrew? What do you think's going to save you, give you life? I mean, what a conversation starter. I want you to look at verse 41. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, we have found the Messiah, which means the Christ. So Andrew, Andrew's gospel conversation begins this way. Hey, bro, we found the better David. It seems that Peter's a religious guy. He knows his Bible pretty well. So what is happening here is Andrew knows his brother, so he starts a gospel conversation where it's intelligible to his brother. You know, you don't walk up to someone who doesn't go to church, has never been to church. You certainly wouldn't do this in my hometown up in Simsbury, Connecticut. Five generations of people don't go to church and say, hey, man, are you washed in the blood? Am I what? That's unintelligible. A gospel conversation is intelligible to the person. And there's not a more intelligible question than asking somebody, hey, man, what are you looking for in life? What do you want out of life? In other words, parentheses, what's your salvation? What's a good gospel conversation starter for your family, for your friends, for your new friends? Are they religious? Or perhaps you could start this way. Hey, what are you looking for in life? Or you could say something like, hey, do you, do you find trying to be good enough as a mom exhausting like me? That's a great conversation for a religious person. Or if it's an rel- irreligious person, maybe you say something like, hey, what are you looking for in life? Or you say something like, hey, have you, I really want to know what you think. I know you don't go to church and, you know, what we do. And I really want to, I'm interested in knowing what your take is on Jesus. Who do you think he is? What do you, what's your take on him? Simple ordinary conversations. Do you notice how reaching people by gospel conversations here are so normal and so ordinary and so natural? They're not weird. They're not unnatural. They're not these awkward, hokey things being said. They're not these fake, plastic, whatever being said. There's no canned approaches. There's nothing fake. No one here is being super spiritual. No one here is acting morally superior to anyone else. It's just ordinary, normal, human, humane conversations of reality. Y'all, do you know what happens when you touch reality in this world? I mean, watch what happens. If a movie, if a movie ventures to touch reality, if a song touches reality, if someone writes a book that touches reality, everybody wants it. It wins all the awards. 
people were made for reality. We starve for reality. And Christians, we should be the most real people on the planet. Normal, ordinary, boring, unspectacular, natural people. Making friends, having normal gospel conversations. Now watch this. You look at how Philip starts a gospel conversation with Nathaniel. You see what Nathaniel does? He throws him a curveball. I mean, it's a pretty good curveball. He tells him about Jesus, that he's from Nazareth. And what does is, what is Nathaniel say? Man, can anything good come out of that place? Come on. Andrew, that's the most insignificant place on the planet. How would the Messiah come from there? And notice how Philip responds to him. Come and see, dude. He doesn't freak out. He doesn't need to be in control. He doesn't even need to be right. He says, come on, man, come check it out for yourself. You tell me if anything significant can come out of Nazareth. You see if he's significant or not. Maybe he is insignificant. You have a conversation with someone, I don't even believe the Bible, and you'd be like, yeah, wow, yeah, okay. Well, what are you struggling with the Bible? And you tell them, and you don't even understand it, right? But here's what you say. You say something like, well, you know, let's, let's just check out what the Bible says if it was true. It'd be kind of fun for you. Would you want to know just what it says about that particular thing that you were asking me about? Even though it might not be true, maybe it is. And if it is, this is what it says. It's just come and see, come and see, come and see. Or as Izzy Beechner said to all the emergency we've been praying for Izzy, remember he parachuted, he was getting... His, what was he getting? He was getting um, his Marine, I don't want to say ordination because that's what we get, but he was something official. What was it? Be, commission. That's it. He's being commissioned and he took all of his buddies and his Special Forces buddies and they went parachuting and he landed into a power line. And we've been praying for him and he's sitting right over there. But normal gospel conversations is all the emergency personnel are rushing to help him, loading him onto a helicopter and air flighting him out because he needed immediate attention. He's tapping on his earpiece, and they put on all their earpieces. And he says, listen, uh, I'm not a holy roller or anything, but just in case you're wondering, God is real. I just experienced him. Normal, ordinary, natural conversations. If you don't want to reach people, avoid those. Be hokey, be weird, be stupid. Lastly, avoid seeing greater things for yourself. Look at verse 50. Jesus answered, and because I said to you, I saw you under a fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Verse 51, truly, truly I say to you, you will see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. I love what the scholars say about that ascending and descending. It means the angels are already on earth because they ascend first and then descend. So they're already, the supernatural is already all around us. And when Jesus shows up, they ascend and descend on him. What's happening? What are these greater things? Well, Jesus himself right now wants to give you a specific aspect of who he is and what he's done from this text. The background to it is he's going all the way back to Genesis 28. He's going back to Jacob. It's crazy. Remember what Jacob was like? He was a loser. He was a complete loser. How do I know this? Well, read the account, number one. Of the two brothers, you got Esau and you got Jacob. I side with Esau every single time, every time I read it. I'm like, Jacob, you're a loser. He knew he was a loser. He steals his brother's rights, his birthrights, his inheritance, and runs off because his brother's a kind of a more aggressive kind of guy. And he heads off, and he goes into Babylon. Remember where the Tower of Babel was built? And in the tower, in the land that he's at, he's now outside the promised land. He's outside the land of his fathers, and he's in a land of ziggurats. He goes to bed at night. He has no thought for God. He doesn't give a lick about God. He doesn't give a lick about his family. He deceived his dad. He betrayed his brother. He's a loser. And in 
that night a ziggurat from heaven touched down to earth and angels were ascending and descending on that ziggurat and God stood at the top and spoke to him and he became a Christian right he believed in God and Jesus says I'm Jacob's ziggurat. I'm what connects heaven and earth, God and you. I bring them together. And that's why he says he's the son of man, because the son of man brings two dynamic, powerful realities. The son of man is what Jesus says about himself more than anything else. He doesn't say, I'm Lord more than this. He doesn't say, I'm the Christ more than this. He doesn't say, I'm the Messiah more than this. He says over 80 times, I'm the Son of Man. And the Son of Man brings this, it brings Daniel 7, this otherworldly heavenly being, with Psalm 8, this one made even lower than the angels, a man. It brings highness and humility. It brings majesty and mercy. It brings glory and it brings grace and it brings God and it brings man together in one name. It makes this heavenly human hero who comes to comprehensively open up heaven and connect heaven and earth and you and God together. In other words, what do you really want? That's what we really want. That's what we were made for. That's salvation. And John says, do you see that? I'm going to apply it by mentioning the first miracle that Jesus does. And most of us are thinking, wait, that doesn't happen until the wedding at Cana, right? That's chapter 2. And most scholars do say that. So I'm, I'm stepping out a little bit here. I say, no. The first miracle actually happens in verse 42. Look at it. He brought him to Jesus. Andrew brings his brother to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, so you're Simon, son of John. <laughs> you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. Jesus names Simon the rock man. In the ancient Near East, your name was the totality of your existence. Your name was the totality of your identity. Your name was the totality of your person, your personhood, your personality, your body, your spirit, everything about you. And so when Jesus names Simon the rock man, he just named his whole being. Now, here's the incredible part. It's not that. It is that, but when you get this part, it gets even more incredible. In all four Gospels, Peter is not anywhere near being the rock man. He's more like jello man or the sand man. And so the first miracle that Jesus does as the son of man, the one who's God and perfect man. By him being God and perfect man, he achieves a righteousness on earth that he can now give to people who aren't. And so when he turns to Peter, he says to Peter, he creates a someone out of a no one. He speaks life where there is none. He creates out of nothing. You're the rock man. Because all the rock righteousness that I achieve is now yours, Peter. Even though you're still like Jello, that's who you are. If you don't want to reach people, don't see greater things like that. If you do reach people, 
if you want to reach people and you see greater things like that, you know what happens? You are now free. Free. You're the rock man. You're the rock woman. You're the righteous one. You are now free to go reach people by exposing them to biblical preaching, by making friends. Go make friends. Go have gospel conversations. Go reach people. Amen.